You know, the video, Josh found that this morning, and, and we, were, we were laughing about it. Um, but, you know, taming the tongue is, is a pretty difficult thing to do. And uh, I can remember as a, um, as a young man uh, through middle school and, and through high school, and I think I've told you guys this before, but, but I, I, I cussed a lot. Uh, it was, uh, and it was bad cussing, uh, real bad. If, if some of you, if some of my sweet ladies in this church would hear the way your pastor spoke when he was a middle and high schooler, you would probably turn and run. But it was, um, it was pretty, it was pretty rough. It wasn't until I became a Christian my senior year in high school and met a, uh, a wonderful young woman named Christina, not that Christina, it was another Christina, and um, this Christina had very hard knuckles on the back of her hand. Anybody care to ask how I knew that her knuckles were really hard on the back of that hand? Yeah, um, shortly after becoming a Christian, uh, I, I, I liked this girl a lot, and we would hang out a lot, and, and again, my mouth did not exude Christian things. And uh, I would drop some words that I didn't need to drop, and I would be abruptly stopped by the back of her hand. She didn't hit me hard, just enough, just a little pop, just a, hey, you're a Christian. We don't talk like that. And so this, this went on for, for a while until I finally, I would do a couple things. I would cuss, and then I would do this. I, would, I knew it was coming, and, 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 slowly, and surely, um, slowly and surely my language cleaned up. It, it took a while. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because, like I said, I cussed pretty bad uh, middle school, high school. And while it was always on the tip of my tongue, do you know who never heard a cuss word? Any of my teachers, ever, not once. You know who else never heard cuss words? My mom and dad. Being a youth pastor all those years and, and dealing with this subject... I'd have so many students come to me and say, I just can't control it. I just can't control it. I just can't control it. And I would always say, do you cuss in front of your teachers? Well, no. You, you can't control it. You, you can't control the things that you say, the things that come out of your mouth. And so for me, I had to learn that. I had to learn it the hard way. And, and it took quite a while, uh, years, in fact, after becoming a Christian. I, I would go months and months and months, and then something would happen, and boom, there it was. And then I'd feel horrible and... and, and I'd start keeping track on the calendar again. All right, let's start at ground zero and, and work from here. And, and, and this went on for, for quite a while until I finally got a, a handle on the, the words that would come out of my mouth, so to speak. But we have people that we look to, people that, 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 that our kids look up to, people that some of you guys look up to, that we're not the only ones that have trouble controlling our tongue. There are a lot of people, even in sports, that have trouble controlling their tongue. Now, now while... I'm going to show you some pictures here in just a second. Okay, not yet, in just a second. I'm not disrespecting these people in any way. You can do your own research and find out if the things that I say are true or not. So if this is your favorite sports figure, I'm sorry for a couple of reasons. Anyway, all right, first of all, the very first person, Mr. Tom Brady. He's a wonderful quarterback. He's won many, many Super Bowls and an awesome guy. Tom Brady has a problem, though. He likes to say a certain word especially after he's thrown an interception. And uh, it was, uh, it's a fact that after a couple of seasons of him going back to the bench and saying this particular word four times in a row as loud as he could, even though the microphones couldn't pick it up, the camera sure did, and the people sure knew what he was saying. Uh, the uh, ownership of the Patriots went to Tom and said, you got to tone it down. And so Tom apologized Yes, it was a very heartfelt apology from Tom, but, uh, but, but he's tried to work on his tongue a little bit, and uh, I think things have gotten a little bit better for Tom. There, our next figure, somebody everybody's going to know, Mr., Mr. Tiger Woods, he was the LeBron James of, uh, of golf for a long, long time, and Tiger was a really awesome golfer. He would do amazing shots that, uh, that nobody else could do, and it seemed like he just dominated the sport for a long time, but, but Mr. Tiger had an issue as well. It was his temper, right? And uh, 
he would express his vocabulary on the golf course when he'd miss a putt or when he'd, he'd miss a drive or when he'd uh, miss an approach shot. You could, you could pretty much tell what Mr. Tiger Woods was saying, even though the microphones couldn't pick it up and they couldn't hear. But uh, just like Tom Brady, they figured out a way to help Tiger whenever he got too upset. And he would chew on his $8,000 golf club and... Um, then he would throw it away and get another one out for the next round. It was no big deal for him. But, but we see this all the time. We see people who struggle with taming their tongue. We, we see it in other sports, baseball. We see it in baseball. And you guys are like, well, I don't really see that a lot in baseball. Oh, you do. You may not catch it. You ever know when a pitcher is getting absolutely rocked at the plate and the manager comes out? What's a pitcher almost 99% of the time, he, what does he do? Takes his glove. He puts it over his mouth and he turns and I'm sure he's not saying, I'm so glad my manager came out here just now. Those aren't the words that that, that are coming into his glove, but we struggle. We struggle with taming our tongue. And, and, And it's more importantly than that, it has to do with the words that we say, you can take Tiger off there, I'm sure it's he's good. He's bit that golf club enough. Curse words are everywhere. They're in our song lyrics to listen to on the radio. The average television show is, is full of, of profanity. And this is, this is normal stuff. I mean, we're not talking about things that are on late at night. We're talking about middle of the afternoon you know, TV shows. What, what, what many consider family TV shows have cuss words in them. Movies. Movies will almost always have dirty words, and usually the big dirty words. Uh, There was a, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but there was a movie that came out uh, this spring, and uh, it was a highly anticipated movie, did did awesome at the box office, uh, was ranked as one of the highest movies of its um, genre to date, and I think it had 85 F-bombs in it, I think. There couldn't have been much other dialogue. I mean, if that's... It's insane. Children oftentimes pick up on these nasty little four-letter words at school. Many blogs, social media sites, YouTube. If you let your kids watch YouTube, you better police what they're watching. Josiah was watching Thomas the Train the other day. Some adult had made a special Thomas the Train and stuck it in the mix of all the other Thomas the Trains. And as Christine is walking through Walmart with Thomas the Train, Thomas' mouth wasn't too nice. And she's like, what are you watching? And she changed it. But the list goes on and on and on. I know, I can remember, I know many of you can remember a time when if a cuss word slipped out, it was followed immediately by, oh, sorry, pardon me, excuse me. Didn't, didn't mean to say that. Sorry. Whoops. My bad. Anymore, it's become ingrained in our society. Daily conversations. To the point, to the point where if you don't use cuss words and, and curse words, if, if you don't use them, people look at you at, as, as, a, as a nerd or as a goody-goody. That's how far things have shifted throughout the years. I, even, even I, have been made fun of at times because I didn't use profanity where profanity, according to the world, was expected. So we're going to start this morning, and, and, and we're going to get into this a little bit, and then I'm going to make a couple of apologies. No, I'm not going to cuss, but, but I'm going to make a couple of apologies as we get into this uh, because some things that, that we need to make clear. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about what cussing is. I need somebody to come up and give us an example on... No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. What is cussing? Well, it's bad or dirty words that we use to explain something, maybe show emotion or show emphasis in something. Maybe it's, it's words that we use to try to seem a little bit tougher than we really are. Cussing... Uh, Cussing is looked at as, by children as, as grown-up language. And talk like, I hope not in here, but talk like mom and dad talk. 
and use the big adult words. In order to understand fully what cussing is, there's, there's a couple words that we need to define. There's a couple words that we need to be very clear on what exactly they mean. That first word is curse. Okay? And we say cuss, we say curse, we kind of use them interchangeably sometimes. But a curse word by definition is a profane or obscene word, especially as used in anger for emphasis. Okay? A profane or obscene word. So the very next thing that we need to do is we need to try to understand, okay, well, what does profane mean? Let's, let's, let's make this as clear as we can. Profanity is this. It's defined by Merriam-Webster as an offensive word or offensive language that's also considered to be called bad language, strong language, coarse language, foul language, bad words, vulgar language, lewd language, swearing, cursing, cussing, or using explicatives. Is that pretty clear? Uh, this is generally considered by most, uh, in, in, in most dialects, in most language, cursing is considered to be strongly impolite or rude, even offensive. It can show a debasement of someone or something or it can show intense emotion. Profanity, in this sense, takes the form of words or verbal expressions that fall into the category of what they consider to be formulaic language. So what does that mean? Well, let's, let's, let's try to make this clear. Basically, what you're saying is, in the, in the midst of your conversation, as you're discussing a subject or as you're talking with someone, you get to a certain point in the story or you get to a certain point of emphasis and your brain somehow magically says, normal dialect isn't going to get the word and the feeling across enough. We need to use something a little more powerful. We need to use something with a little force behind it. And so for those that struggle with controlling the tongue, it's, it's usually replaced with one of these words that we've discussed to give it just a little more oomph, right? Just a little more bang for the buck when, 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 you're, when you're sharing these stories. There's something else about profanity. In its, in its older, more literal sense, the term profanity actually refers to offensive words or religious words used in a way that shows that the user does not respect God or holy things. That's where the word profanity comes from. By definition, it means that you don't respect God or the things of God. It's pretty clear. We haven't even asked what the Bible says yet, but it's pretty clear. There's also another word that we need to make sure that we understand, and that is, that is vain. V-A-I-N. Some of you guys know that it talks about this in the Ten Commandments, but the word vain in this sense, the actual definition, is producing no result, it's useless, or it's empty. That's what vain means in this context when we're, talking about, when we're talking about cussing. Simply put, a vain word is intended to bring whatever it is that you're talking about, no value. It's emptying. It's void of anything special. Hang on to that. Because we're going to go back to that in a minute. So where did cussing come from? Somebody says, my mouth? Well, Maybe. The term profane originates from classical Latin. It literally translates, when you look at the words, it literally translates to before or outside the temple. You following where this is going? It carried the meaning of either desecrating what is holy or desecrating that which has a righteous purpose. Hmm. Profanity represents secular indifference to religious things or religious figures. Profanity, in the original meaning, basically means a blasphemous type of profanity. This was part of the ancient traditions where, where people would use profanity to laugh and or scoff at deities or God himself. It's pretty, pretty interesting once you start to get right down 
to what exactly it is that goes on when you cuss and when you use profanity. I would also, I, I would not be doing my job, I don't think, if, if I didn't explain a little bit about what the word cuss and where the word cuss comes from. And most of you guys are, are aware of this. It, it actually is an adaptation of the word curse, right? You've heard that before. You're cussing, you're cursing, okay? We've already looked at what the definition of, of curse is, but there's another part of curse that, that we didn't define. And if you look up curse in the dictionary, you're going to find a couple of different examples, and this is the second one that we see. A curse is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. We're probably most familiar with how this is used in this context with a couple of scriptures. Genesis 12, 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 3, 14, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So we get this, this, this understanding, this context of what the word curse means. It's bad, right? It's not a good thing. To curse someone means that you're you're basically saying, in, 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 in a way, you are casting down some sort of supernatural power to do something harmful to someone else. Now, immediately, somebody's going to say, so what you're telling me is when I cuss somebody, I'm invoking some supernatural power to inflict harm on them. My answer is yes. Whether you intend it to be or not, yes. You are. Why do we say that? Well, think about it. Any combination of cuss words that you may ramble off towards someone in aggression, you're not intending them to have good luck. Right? What are you doing when you cuss someone out? What are you doing when you curse someone out? You're not hoping that good things happen to them. When you cuss at someone, when you curse at someone, you are, in essence, dealing with with a pretty ancient, powerful thing. And somebody may say, well, what, what, what if when I don't use, you know, these words towards somebody? What if I just cuss to cuss just to cuss because it's, it's kind of what I say? Well, even in those situations, even in that context, there is still a very real spiritual manifestation that takes place when you use these words that have to do with this power. Think about it. And one of you, even, even this morning, even in the sanctuary, I joked around with a couple people that I know cuss. I'm just kidding. I don't know that you cuss. But I joked around with a couple people this morning and said, you need to listen to the sermon. And, and somebody told me, you know, that when they hurt themselves, they were joking. They're like, but I sometimes, you know, say this or I sometimes say that. Is it not a release when you hurt yourself and you cuss if that's what you do? Is there not something that is released, that is painful, that is hurtful, that is something a little dark? You hit your thumb with a hammer. You smash your hand in a car door. You're using a hatchet when you're 12 years old and you accidentally bounce it off the tree that your mom and dad said you weren't supposed to be messing with with the hatchet in the first place and it cut your knee and requires you to have stitches. Yes, mom and dad, I remember that. We say things to help us release the pain, maybe? Cussing and sin are both as old as time and they bear a great likeness to one another. So let's see, what does the Bible have to say about cussing? Well, based on the things that we've read so far, we probably don't need to go any further. I think we all get it. But the Bible very clearly tells us that we are to abstain from this form of art that comes out of our mouth. The Old Testament, Proverbs 4.24, remove perverse speech from your mouth, keep devious talk far from your lips. Proverbs 21, 23, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. 
Proverbs 10, 7 to 8, his mouth is full of coarse curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in lurking places of the villages and the hiding places. He kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. The New Testament, Romans 3, 13 to 14, their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. James 1.26, if a person thinks he's religious but can't control his tongue, he is fooling himself. That person's religion is worthless. Matthew 12, 35 to 36, good people do the good things that are in them, but evil people do the evil things that are in them. I can guarantee that on judgment day, people will have to give an account of every careless word they say. Ladies and gentlemen, That's only a handful, a very small handful of the scriptures on cursing and profanity. But even based on those, we have very little, if any, wiggle room at all when it comes to this concept of cussing and swearing and cursing as born-again believers in Christ. The Bible very clearly condemns this. It looks at cussing and cursing as, as as a dark, dark part of the human experience. Something that we something that we should avoid. Some things to keep in mind about cussing. Now, before we and no, I'm not rolling my sleeves up because it's getting bad. I'm rolling my sleeves up because it's a little warm in here. Before we go any further, I want to share a couple of scriptures with you. Can I can I do that before we get into our points? Please pay close attention to these couple of scriptures. Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. In 2 Corinthians three eighteen. but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as the Lord, the Spirit. Having said those three scriptures, let me share... Just a couple of quick things. Number one, I am your pastor. I was called here by God in a committee to come and to uphold and maintain the congregation in a godly standard. That's iron sharpening iron. I'm also your friend. Hopefully, most of you I consider a friend. Hopefully, you consider me a friend. That means that while I will not lie to you, some of the things that I may share with you this morning, they may be hurtful. If I were your enemy, I would multiply kisses, which means I wouldn't bring it to your attention. And finally, 2 Corinthians says, just as we read, we are to be as a mirror reflecting the glory of the Lord. Meaning that we are to reflect Christ in all that we do, even the things that we say. So please know, please know that when we discuss these points, I do so out of love. That's my way of saying this morning, the gloves have come off when we talk about this, not because it's my words, but because this is what Scripture has to say about the subject. So with that being said, let's look at what exactly cussing reflects. Number one, cussing reflects a poor vocabulary. Ouch, right? That's pretty hurtful. How dare your pastor say something like that? I know, I know. And I know some of you right now are going, well, isn't, isn't cursing considered to be colorful language? That means I'm, ex- I'm expressing how I feel and I use all of these wonderful words. Colorful, perhaps. I'll give you that. But all too often when somebody cusses and they do so as part of their vernacular, and what I mean by that is it's part of their everyday language. It's, it's not something that they did, whoops, I slipped, I said this, whoops, I slipped, I said that. It's laced within every sentence, within every paragraph, within every thought. That is how they're communicating back and forth. When it becomes that, their ability to communicate shows a lack of vocabulary. For example, I, uh, shortly after I became a Christian, I was in college, I, I was still struggling with, with controlling my tongue, uh, 
I was doing a lot better. You know, I was only messing up maybe once every couple of weeks, once every couple of months. And I was leaving a Kmart one afternoon. I was walking through the parking lot, and this car was going down the aisle. And it turned into another aisle where this truck was coming out of, and basically it cut the truck off. To which the guy in the truck rolls down his window and delivers this soliloquy of colorful language. For about 30 or 40 seconds, he did this. At no point in any of that aimless rambling did he have anything close to a coherent thought, ever, not once. It was a bunch of cuss words just thrown together here or there intermittently with with these and thes and and yous. But nothing was ever, there was no sentence structure. And And I'm sitting here going... And, and, and as people are coming out of Kmart, they're, they're witnessing this, and, I, and I'm just in shock that this is taking place. And I'm like, dude, you're crazy. And, and it really kind of got my attention from that point on to think of, of, of how, how foolish I sounded when I used these words. You know, a sentence is made up of a couple of parts, a subject and a predicate, Right? The subject is the thing that you're talking about. The predicate is the thing that, that happens, right? Apparently, this guy didn't, he wasn't there for that lesson in school because he had neither. Oh, well, I'll take that back. He had a subject. It was the guy in the car. There was no, there was no clarity on anything that he said. And in fact, while he was trying to look tough and macho and, and, and express his feelings and his emotions, he really actually looked like a buffoon. And I don't use that word a lot, but he did. Too often, too often when individuals can't find the right words to use to express their feelings or their emotions, they replace them with this colorful language. It makes them feel like their point got across a little bit better. When in reality, it simply shows that they have a poor vocabulary. If that one didn't hurt, point number two might. Cussing reflects an inwardly dirty heart. Ouch again. Some of them may go, Jason, that's a bit of a stretch to say that just because somebody cusses every now and then reflects the fact that they have a dirty heart. Yes, that would be very harsh. I'll give you that. But those aren't my words. Those are Jesus' words. So talk with him about that. Matthew fifteen ten to 19 says, And he called the people to him, and he said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable. To us, And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and it is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Obviously, the conversation, the context of what was going on here, the, the, the Pharisees had seen the disciples not wash their hands before they ate, and, and they were trying to get Jesus caught up into the tradition versus the new covenant, and, and he's trying to explain to them, it doesn't matter what they put into their mouth because they're going to expel it anyway. I don't need to explain that. But what he's saying is it's what comes from the inside, out of your mouth. That is what matters. The heart is more important than the stomach in this case. What comes out of your mouth will show what's in your heart. Unclean words, unclean heart. Talk to Jesus. When we, as followers of Christ, use dirty words and and we cuss in our daily language, our light to the world is extinguished. And we do not reflect Christ. 
and the things that we say. That in and of itself, I should be able to be done and just have invitation and go home. But if that's not bad enough, if that's not bad enough, Jesus also says that our unclean words lead us into depravity and sin. 2 Timothy 2.16 says, But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. When we, when we indulge in, in, in what he considers to be worldly chatter, in, in empty chatter, our Christian purity is basically emptied out. It's, it's flushed away. It doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore because we are, we are we're being like the world. We're called to let our light shine, right? There was a time uh, in my later years of college where I worked, at, uh, I worked at Sonic for a long time growing up, through high school and then through college, and, and everybody knew that I was a Christian. Uh, everybody knew that, that, that by this point I had tamed my tongue, so to speak, and, and it had been years since I had, had, had dropped anything bad at all. And, uh, and, and yes, I was made fun of from time to time at Sonic, and, and there was one particular night where things were not going the way that they should have been going at Sonic, and I was pretty mad and pretty upset, and I'd had my limit, and I exploded. And I broke out into a soliloquy, not unlike the guy in the Kmart parking lot. You know what happened? My, my friends at Sonic... They, um, they didn't bow their head in, in shame and, and encourage me to stop. They didn't say, oh, I know this is, that's tough because I know you don't like to cuss and I know you've really been working on that. You know what they did? They cheered. They hooped and they hollered. Jason, you are awesomely funny when you cuss. You need to do this all the time. And I went, awesome, cool, yeah, okay. For the next couple of weeks, I let some words fly. While the outside world around me applauded, the Holy Spirit inside of me was appalled. Shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter, God really spoke to me and, and, and made that clear. And of course, I went into work the next day, and I apologized. I believe that was probably one of the last times that I ever said uh, anything that I would consider to be a cuss word. Number three, cussing reflects a secular behavior. What do I mean by that? Cussing reflects an ungodly behavior. Much of uh, swearing, as you read and as you study through God's Word, you're going to find out that much of swearing uh, is connected to this idea and this concept of swearing an oath to some degree. Uh, to swear means to make a solemn declaration invoking some sort of a deity or a sacred person or thing uh, to confirm uh, honesty, truth, or, or, or the intentions of something that, that, that you're talking about. Basically, for this oath to be fulfilled and you swear to do something, I swear that I'll do it. We're taught as Christians that we are not to swear. A common example of this would, would, would be what we see in the courtroom when, when you're supposed to, to make an oath on the Bible. I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. It's funny that they ask us to do something that the Bible tells us not to do, yet we have to put our hand on the Bible to do it. Swearing oaths was commonplace in Jesus' day. He took oath swearing a step further in Matthew 5, 33. He says this, Again, you've heard it said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's, for if it is God's throne, or by the earth, for if it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. This issue behind swearing, it has to do with the sacredness of who God is. 
His name, His power, His sovereignty. When we use His name in vain, and we talked about that a minute ago. You know, we talked a minute ago about what vain means in this context, and it means to empty, it means to to make void of, to, to make it mean nothing. When we use God's name in vain, in essence, what are we doing? We're basically saying that God is void of anything. He's empty. He's nothing. We throw it around, and, and, and how many times a day do we hear this exact thing take place? When we use this colorful language, so to speak, as, as our everyday dialect, we're basically acting like the world. We are reflecting a secular behavior. And somebody may say this, now Jason, are you telling me that just because sometimes I cuss when I get really mad and I'm really out of sorts and I just, I let something slip, are you telling me that I'm acting worldly at that point? Are you telling me that, 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 that I'm acting and reflecting the world? Yeah, you are. I'm sorry. That was my apology. Remember, no gloves this morning. The gloves have come off. Not because I took them off, but because that's what God's Word instructs. Number four. Man, this has been painful. Are we almost done? We need to get through this. Number four may be the most hurtful of all. Cussing reflects a lack of maturity in the Christian faith. It reflects a lack of maturity in the Christian faith. If you, thought, if you thought the first point was, was rough, now I'm telling you that if you cuss like a sailor, you're not a strong disciple of Christ. Well, yeah. Why do I say that? Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, 29 to 30, he says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building others up. As fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, And do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This meaning of corruptive talk is its pretty obvious what he's talking about. Our talk as Christians should be to build others up according to their needs. This implies that we have to know what their needs are. Right? We have to be discerning enough to see and to sense and to understand what the person needs who needs building up, needs built up in. They may need comfort, guidance, encouragement, acceptance, approval, or even loving rebukes. But how will we ever know what it is that they need unless we ourselves are walking in the Spirit and are close to God through a discipleship process and are maturing as a Christian? It's kind of like an indirect, direct correlation, right? This, this whole idea, this relationship between corrupt talk and a lack of discipleship. It's been rough this morning. I, I didn't mean for it to be that rough, but as I started preparing and, and, and studying, there's not a lot of good things that you can say about cussing. I'm going to ask that as, as we prepare to close that Josh would come up and that they would get ready for invitation. But I want to make something, something clear. The Bible tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are supposed to have clean speech and the ways in which we verbalize and the ways in which we communicate. We are to filter our mouths. We are to learn to to tame our tongue, as hard as it may be. And I I used to think, I used to think that um, it's okay to cuss when the situation is necessary, like you, you, like I said before, you've hurt yourself or something really, 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 really bad has happened. Ladies and gentlemen, as, as believers in Christ, those are the exact times that we shouldn't. Those are the exact times that we are to overcome the temptation to cuss. In normal, everyday talk, that's, 
If you really wanted to tame your tongue, you could. It's those times when, boom, it happens that quick. Those are the times that it, that it counts. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 8 to 9, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any worthy, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. That's a pretty complex way of going back over what Jesus just told his disciples about the things you put into your stomach and the things that you put into your heart and the things that come out. There's another scripture that says, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. What does that mean? Well, that means you put junk in, you put junk in, you put junk in, you're going to get junk out. Now, I've said all of that, and I want to make something else clear. This is, this is the last thing. If you're here this morning and you cuss like a sailor, not Sailor Reed, but if you cuss like a sailor and you struggle and you're like, well, I know I can't be the only one, and this, this place has got to be full of a bunch of hypocrites, and, and, and you, feel, you feel like this has been an attack on you, let me share with you that you're in the exact place that you need to be this morning. Yes, you are in here with a bunch of other hypocrites because we all struggle with something. It may not be cussing. It may not be drinking or any other things that we've dealt with over the last month or so, but every one of us struggles with sin in our life. We are no one any better than anybody else, myself included in that. So please, if you're here this morning and and, and you felt like... um, you felt like you've been attacked or you felt like it's been aimed directly at you, that wasn't the intention. All I'm trying to do is what, what I was called to do, and that is, that is to reveal God's Word and to say that we all, we all need to be held to that standard. This morning, I would ask that you would stand. And we're going to have a word of prayer as, as we get ready for our invitation. And I want to encourage you this morning, if, if, if God has, has, has spoken to you and there's a decision that you need to make or, or, or if God has spoken to you and, and you need to come down and spend some time at the altar in prayer with Him, I want to encourage you to do that. Again, I always try to make it so very clear, just because you come to the altar doesn't mean that you are a dirty-tongued devil, right? It just means that there's something on your heart. And so I want to encourage you this morning that, that the Holy Spirit would, would move in your life and that you would respond Accordingly, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, this concept of taming, taming the tongue is, is not easy. Lord, I, I have been there. Lord, I have struggled. God, I pray that if there are those in this room this morning, Lord, that, that, that struggle with, with this issue, Lord, that you would challenge them, God that you would encourage them, Lord. God, that you would bring to mind that the things that they say, the words that come out of their mouth, Lord, they are to reflect you. And God, if the things that we say are not reflecting you, that something needs to change. Lord, I pray this morning that your spirit would move amongst us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.